Let's go ahead and jump into today's topic. And as usual, if you have any questions, post them in the Q&A or in the chat. Happy to answer those as we go along. Um, yeah, I think that's it. So let's get to today's webinar, how to work with self-storage brokers. A uh, couple things to mention real quick before we jump into the topic. Uh, consult your CPA, financial planner, or attorney before investing in real estate or making any financial decisions that can impact your future. We love self-storage, but don't just take our word for it that it's a great investment. Second thing is we aren't paid to recommend anything. So if we recommend Yardy Matrix or a property management company or whatever, we're not paid to do that. It's all uh, things that we like and use, and we recommend that you use them as well. All right. And everything I'm talking about in today's webinar is going to be specific to North Carolina brokerage laws. Okay. So state law um, in North Carolina regarding brokerage and being a broker. Uh, so you want to check with your local state real estate commission. Okay, so if you live in Colorado or San Antonio, Texas, um, or Alabama, there is just Google Alabama real estate commission. And the commission, and you'll find the contact information, etc. cetera. Uh, and the commission, they represent the public. They work in the best interest of the public. So if you are not a broker, uh, they actually work to make sure that you are served well by the brokers in their state. Um, believe me, we'll jump into, into that a little bit more as we go along, but I just want to mention that. So everything I talk about here is specific to North Carolina, okay? Uh, but check with your local state laws to see how they might change or vary based upon what I'm saying in the webinar. All right. All right, guys and gals, we have a lot to cover here in this first part, and um, it'll kind of Hopefully it'll all make sense once, once we get through it. And then we have a few more bullet points at the end about how to position yourself with a broker and what kind of bro uh, buyers do brokers want to work with, you know, those sorts of things, which are, uh, when you th think about it, they're pretty common sense, but we'll hit those here in a minute. First up, the first bullet point uh, is what brokers hope that you don't understand, all right? And I don't mean that in a way where brokers are devious, okay? Let me get that, let me say that also that I am not putting down or saying that we should not work with brokers or that they're all snakes or something like that, okay? That is the furthest thing from the truth. We love working with brokers. Uh, they bring us plenty of deals and they're uh, good folks to work with. However, there are some things that as a buyer uh, or even a seller, but as a buyer, this, I'm specifically talking to buyers here because a lot of us as buyers that we want to work with the brokers and find off market deals and be uh, you know, on their mailing list and that when we make an offer, we want them to consider us as being a serious buyer, et cetera. So that's where... The, the gist of the focus of this webinar is going to be towards people who are trying to buy deals and work with brokers. So what, uh, in a sense, what they hope you don't understand are a couple of things. One is agency. Material facts is number two, what those are. Misrepresentation, what that means. Okay, so three things. As I scroll through my notes here, agency, what that is. We'll cover that here in a second. Material facts, what those are. And misrepresentation. All right, what those things, what that is as well, and how you know brokers can kind of get in trouble here and there. Shanika says she is a realtor, realtor. It is not three syllables; it's two. Realtor, right? So awesome, Shanika. Uh, I used to, by the way, guys, if you guys are wondering where all this is coming from, I used to teach real estate license law for the state of North Carolina. Uh, so that's, and I've been a broker for 14 years. I have my license as well. Uh, right now, in inactive status. Okay. All right. So agency. <clears throat> What is agency? Shanika, this will kind of be par for the course for you and it might remind you of your real estate licensing classes. I'm not sure what Alabama, how their laws are, are set up and all that, but it might remind you some of these things. But agency, it's kind of what you think of. I agent, you know, my, uh, if you're a movie, like if you're in movies or whatever, I have an agent, I call my agent or whatever. You hear those people, people say those kinds of things. Uh, my real estate agent, what is it? At a high level, there's a universal agent, there's a general agent, there's a special agent. Universal is an unlimited power of attorney situation. They can, an attorney or whomever might have the power of attorney over your estate or over yourself can sign, can bind you to contracts, can basically do everything that you could do representing you uh, uh, as yourself. All right. So that's a universal agent, a general agent, little less power in that situation. Uh, they have a broad range of things that they can do. They can bind you to contracts. Uh, the best example of this is a property management company. They act on behalf of their owners and uh, the property management company does not take all the leases at the end of the day and send them to the owner for the owner to sign them, right? The property management company signs the lease on behalf of the owner so they can bind the owner to uh, that contract. Uh, 
Uh, so you can think of it that way. And then there's special agent, and they're very limited in what they can do and their scope of abilities, and uh, they cannot bind their um, uh, their uh, customer or their client to any contracts, but they do represent that client uh, in certain dealings and whatnot. And that is what a real estate broker is. They are a special agent because they think that they are special people, right? That's just the way that we like to say it in the real estate classes, just as a little joke there. So uh, we feel like we're special. So you're a real estate broker. Your life is special. You're a special agent representing your client in the transaction of a property, not in anything else, all right? So in either buying or selling a property. And that's what a broker is, all right? So if a broker gets into a situation where they're going to try to bind you to a contract via text, message and that kind of thing that's happened in the state of North Carolina. It's gone to court um, and they determined that all of the um, essential elements were there for a contract. However, an agent cannot bind, a real estate agent cannot bind their client to a contract, uh, which is it's really interesting um, case law and case study there. But anyway, that's what a real estate broker is. They represent you or a seller or a buyer in one specific thing. It is in the buying and selling of a property. All right. Why do we talk about that? Well, we're going to talk, we're going to get to the next thing here. Real quick, not all states practice agency. So you want to double check. I think California might not do that. They just have kind of a, the kind of like a middleman or middle woman, I guess you'd say a middle person between two people, just bringing them together. They don't represent anybody specifically in depth, like we're going to talk about here. Um, and they're just kind of facilitating a transaction. I think that's California. I could be mistaken, but you want to check with your local state to see how do brokers operate in your state? Is there a, uh, is, do they operate under the agency uh, law or do they operate under something else? So you want to double check that, okay? So if we're saying that a client um, or an agent represents their client in a specific transaction, in this case, they're a special agent, that means they have, there are customers and then there's every, excuse me, there are clients and there are everybody else, okay? There are clients and there is, Everybody else. Client is who they owe their fiduciary duties and responsibilities to. Everybody else is considered a customer, and the agent does not owe any fiduciary responsibilities or duties to the customer. Okay. For the client, the fiduciary duties include obedience, loyalty, so obeying lawful things like, hey, I want you to put this down as the price. Uh, I want you to make the um, uh, the listing contract is going to be for this length of period. You know, those kinds of things, not like go break the law, but obedience, loyalty. I owe my loyalty to my, cl uh, to my client as an agent. Disclosure. So I'm going to tell my client certain things and we're going to uh, go a little deeper into disclosure here in a second. Confidentiality. I'm going to keep my client's information confidential. Uh, accounting. I'm going to account for any monies that my client gives to me uh, and reasonable skill and care. I'm going to take reasonable steps to take care of my client to the best of my ability. Does not mean I have to answer the phone at midnight every night when he or she calls, but I will call them back first thing in the morning and make sure they get the answers to the questions that they might have. Okay, so obedience, loyalty, disclosure, confidentiality, accounting, reasonable skill and care. That is what an agent owes to the client. Well, what does the agent owe to everybody else? And in storage, I'm bringing back to storage for a second and buying commercial real estate. If you're a buyer, you are not the client. You are the customer. There is an exception to that. If you have hired an agent, a buyer's agent to represent you, then obviously you are the client. But uh, in every single transaction, when you call and you talk to a broker who is representing a deal, a client, they work for the client, they work with you. Any information you give them on that phone call about yourself, they must go and share with their client. In the state of North Carolina, every single agent represents not the buyer, they represent the seller. Every single agent represents the seller until you hire them to represent you. So that means that they are supposed to disclose any information you say uh, about yourself or your circumstances or whatever to their client or to the seller. And we're not going to go super deep into agency and North Carolina, all that kind of stuff. But the next time you're on the phone with a broker, 
and the broker is asking you questions, you need to realize that everything you tell him or her, they have a duty and a responsibility to go back and tell their client uh, what they discovered about you. So we'll talk about some of this stuff here in a second, but just trying to let you know, okay, so what are you saying here, Chris? Let's take a step back from storage and let's just relate it to buying and selling a house. All right, so you're looking to buy a home, you're gonna to go to such and such neighborhood and look at a listing and it's an open house and you walk in the door and you love it and the agent is there, right? You guys, some of you guys have hopefully been to an open house in the past, but what happens is the doors open you can walk in, you know, like between two and four or whatever the time is of the day. There's balloons out front and signs on the street saying there's an open house. You park a car, you walk down the street, walk in the door, open the door. Usually you're greeted by a nice, friendly real estate agent, real estate broker. And they say, hey, welcome. Come on in. Thank you guys for stopping by. Here's some cookies, whatever. Look around. Here's some information about the property. Uh, love to answer any questions you guys might have, uh, you know, something, whatever. And then you look around the house and you actually love the house. And you're like, man, this is perfect for our kids and whatever. You're talking to your significant other, your spouse or whatever. And you come back downstairs, you talk to the agent and you say, hey, we literally love this house. Uh, what's the pricing and all this kind of stuff? And it's this, this, and this, and this. And you start saying, man, we, we got to move. Uh, we're, we're selling our house in you know, Tennessee and we're moving to North Carolina. Uh, and we got 30 days to identify the next property. And we, uh, we're just in a big rush because of our our, um, our, uh, my job, uh, is relocating me here. Then the family's going to move down afterward. Um, and you know, we got the money in the bank and you're telling all this information because you're excited about it. <coughs> all of that information, the agent is under their uh, fiduciary responsibility to go back and tell their client everything you just said. So if you just disclose to them that you're under a time crunch and you got to move and Hey, I'm willing to pay above list price and all that kind of stuff. And they go back and tell their client all those things. And what's going to happen during the negotiation after you make an offer? Well, they already know you're under the gun. They already know that you're willing to pay above list. They already know you have a good job. You might qualify. You have three kids and a dog and everybody's stressed out. Well, shoot, we're not, we, don't, we can negotiate a little bit harder on that purchase price in the due diligence period, right? Because we know that you're in a situation where you got to make a choice and make a move. And if this house fits everything that you need for your family, it's highly likely that you're going to negotiate with us and probably offer more uh, than what we want. Okay, so if we go back to storage now, you might be saying, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? Like my agent never told me this, or I didn't know. Well, surprise, okay? So that's the situation in the state of North Carolina. Again, check with your local state uh, real estate commission to find out what uh, agency laws pertain to your state, okay? So not every state operates the same, but in North Carolina, it operates that way. So... In uh, commercial real estate, when you go jump over to storage now, all right, so you could get on the phone with the storage broker and you tell them, you know, we're looking for these kinds of facilities, whatever, in these kinds of locations, no big deal there. Uh, but once you start, the way that you frame who you are in your group is going to be very important from there because they have to go back and report to the seller everything that they learned about you and can ascertain about your situation, your capital sources, where they come from, your experience level, et cetera. Now, you don't lie and you don't say, I've closed 10 deals and you closed none. You don't say, I have a lot of experiences in storage when I have none, uh, unless you actually do, right? So if you don't, and we'll talk about this here in uh, later bullet points, the way that you frame everything in that conversation with the broker is going to mean a lot, okay? And it will help you um, in your conversations with them and what they go back and tell the seller. So let's table that for a second. And let's continue on with some of these things here regarding clients and material facts and representation or agency material facts and representation. Okay. So that is what the broker is doing for their client. Okay. At least in the state of North Carolina and in states where they practice the law of agency, they have to go back and disclose to their client, everything about you that they found out. So don't just start spilling information right away when you walk into an open house or when you're looking at, at a deal. Okay. And when you do begin to share information, frame it in a certain way that we'll talk about here in a second, all right? But two things, uh, if you notice in what I said, back to the client slash customer situation, there, were, there was one thing really actually that, uh, that falls into both categories and how they're supposed to treat people. For the client, it was obedience, loyalty, disclosure, confidentiality, accounting, and reasonable skill and care. For the customer, I didn't cover this yet, so for the customer, you have, they have to treat you. So in this case, you're the buyer, right? They represent the seller. So for the broker who represents the seller, to the broker, you are a customer. You're not a client, you're the customer. The customer must be treated with fairness, honesty, 
disclosure of material facts, and they have to promptly present your offer. All right, the last one, don't worry about sometimes because they have a call for offers date and all that, and that's, that's fine. But the point is they got to treat you fairly. So, you know, treat all everybody the same. Honestly, they can't lie to you about stuff. All right, so they got to be straightforward with you about things and disclosure of material facts. And that one there is in both categories of how they got to treat the client and the customer is disclosure, disclosure of material facts. And material facts is the third, is the second, excuse me, the second bullet point under this one, uh, the first one here of what brokers hope you don't understand. So we covered agency. So the second one is material facts. All right, material facts. So what are material facts? Well, they are facts about the property itself. There's four categories in North Carolina. They might differ based upon where you're located. So check on this stuff, okay, with your local state uh, real estate commission. Material facts are defects about the property itself, facts about the surrounding area, anything affecting the ability of uh, the buyer or the seller to close on the property, to perform properly and close on the property. Sorry, my phone rang for a second. And last thing, facts known to be important to the buyer or to, the, to a party. Uh, that one we won't talk about very much. You have a question on it. We can talk about it later on. I want to focus on the first three. So defects about the property, facts about the um, uh, surrounding area, and then anything about the ability to perform or close on the deal. So about the property itself, right? So the property itself, material facts about the property. How many units does it have? How many parking spaces does it have? Uh, what is it zoned? Is it in a flood zone? All of those things about, excuse me, not the uh, zoning and flood zone, that would be about the surrounding area, but uh, zoning itself. Uh, well, actually, I, I take that back. I was thinking about something else. I take that back. Zoning, flood zone, about the property itself, where it's located, uh, what can you do with the property? So how many units does it have? Is there an office? Um, uh, the zoning issues, if you want to develop or add anything else to it, is it in the flood zone? Anything about that property? Oh, the HVAC just got replaced. Uh, there's been a CapEx budget in place for X amount of dollars, you know, whatever. Or the HVAC has not been replaced. It's been 20 years. It's probably going to go out. If the seller mentions that to the broker, the broker is under obligation to just to disclose that information to the buyer. There are a lot of brokers out there in commercial real estate and in storage specifically that don't want to know anything about the property. And we'll talk about that in a second with regarding misrepresentation. Okay. But a broker must disclose anything about the property that they know or should have known, and then also about the surrounding area. So is there any development coming in? Is something being demolished? Is it next to a, uh, you know, a, a waste site? Is it located in an industrial area uh, that's going to be expanded more? Is there a change in the street out front? Is there any construction upcoming that could affect access to the property? Those things are very important. So facts about the surrounding area. Usually in a broker package, they want to highlight all the good things about the surrounding area, right? Population growth and all this stuff. They very rarely highlight anything negative about the surrounding area. We'll talk about that in a second. All right, and then any last, the third thing here under material facts was anything affecting the ability to perform or close. All right, so if you are a cash buyer, that's going to be something important that the buyers, that the uh, broker is going to want to find out. If you're a cash buyer, if you have to get financing, if you've never purchased before. So they're going to ask you certain questions about that and how you frame that will be important. Uh, but the point is, is that they're going to try to ask and find out. And then also on the seller side, is the seller under any um, duress to sell? Are they under a 1031 thing or you know something like that? They have to disclose that information um, to you as a buyer because obviously it's going to be important. Right. So those are the material facts that you want to um, either uncover about the property or that the broker needs to share with you as a buyer. All right. It's disclosure of material facts. Now, what happens? What happens if they don't do that? All right. So we'll talk about the next thing is misrepresentation. And under this one, there's a couple of different versions of misrepresentation that we'll cover real quick. And I'll give you an example of this stuff. OK. So misrepresentation first is willful misrepresentation. There's negligent misrepresentation. There's willful omission. And there's negligent omission. So willful misrepresentation, negligent misrepresentation, 
willful omission and negligent omission. All right, so willful misrepresentation, it is what it sounds like. I willfully, willfully misrepresented something. So I opened my mouth, I said something that was a lie. All right, it wasn't true, therefore it was a lie. I willfully opened my mouth and lied. Negligent misrepresentation. I said something that I thought was true, but I didn't verify it. Okay, willful omission. So omission would mean to keep my mouth shut. I didn't say something and I held it back on purpose. Negligent omission, I kept my mouth shut because I didn't know that there was an issue. But because I'm a broker, I should have known because I got to find out. All right, and sorry if you heard my kids there in the background. Uh, so willful misrepresentation, negligent misrepresentation, willful omission, negligent omission. So let's relate it to storage real quick. Willful misrepresentation. You ask the broker, uh, let's say it's got some units there, non-climate units on the property, and maybe there's a warehouse or just some land space or whatever, and you want to build and you want to add more units. And you, you ask the broker, hey, can we add more units there? Can we develop uh, or convert that warehouse or whatever into more climate controlled units. And the broker says, yes, but they know that you can't for whatever reason, maybe the zoning or something like that. You just can't do it or there's impervious, meaning you can't add any more uh, impervious surface to the property. All right, so they lie to you. That would be a willful misrepresentation. Same thing here. You ask, hey, I would like to convert that or add more climate controlled units. Can I do that? And they say, yes, you can, no problem whatsoever. But they did not verify that you could do that. So that is a negligent misrepresentation. They opened their mouth, but they didn't verify. Maybe they asked the seller, Mr. or Mrs. Seller, uh, can a future buyer add more units here? And the seller says, yes, not a problem. Does that absolve the broker from any liability in that case? No. Because as a commercial real estate broker, they should know that they need to go check the zoning, the planning and zoning website and verify the zoning of the property and then check and see if more units can be added to the facility, to the site. That is the duty of a broker, all right? Most brokers, that's back to what I said, they don't actually wanna know more than, than they need to know to get the property listed. I'll give you an example of this here in a second. Uh, willful omission is the third type of misrepresentation. So willful, I did it on purpose, omission. I held it back. I didn't say something on purpose. <coughs> um, I know that a buyer wants to, let's say I'm a broker, and I know the buyer wants to add more climate controlled units. That's their business plan is to expand facilities and add more units. I know that there's land that comes with the facility but during the phone call or in my offering memorandum, but mostly during the phone call, the buyer did not ask me if any units could be added or developed or built. And I know that they couldn't, but I didn't say anything. I held back the information because uh, I want to get an offer from them. All right. So I willfully omitted information that would have been important to the buyer or anybody else for that matter. That's a willful omission, all right? Negligent omission. I didn't know and I didn't ask. I didn't verify I didn't, because I didn't know to ask. I didn't know to verify. Maybe I'm a brand new broker and I just don't know what I'm doing. <clears throat> and so I don't know to go check the, I should know, but I don't know to go check the uh, planning and zoning website. Or I didn't know to go check the unit mix to make sure that it actually matched what the seller gave me, matched what was actually on site. Right, the seller told me it's 100 units in the in the the uh, rent roll and the unit mix says there's 100 units, but I didn't go actually count the units to make sure there's 100 units. All right, so and I just forgot. I just didn't even think about it. I, negligent om negligent omission, and I didn't tell the next buyer. And the buyer find out finds out when we're in due diligence. I'm like, oh my gosh, I didn't even think of doing that, but I should have, because I'm a storage broker, right? And I'm working under somebody who's guiding me and telling me what to do. My broker in charge. Okay, my manager in a sense. All right, so willful misrepresentation, negligent misrepresentation, willful omission, negligent omission, 
willful misrepresentation. I opened my mouth and I lied about something. I said something was true when it wasn't, something like that. Negligent misrepresentation. I lied about something because I didn't go check. I didn't go verify. I misrepresented and it was negligent because I didn't go verify that that thing was true or not true. Willful omission. I held back on purpose to get an offer or, or get the deal going. Negligent omission. I held back, not on purpose, but because I'm just so green, I didn't know what to do or not do. Right. So the broker can get in trouble for any of these types of misrepresentation. So what does it mean for you as a buyer? You are protected by the laws of your state. Uh, and in the state of North Carolina, if I get down the road in due diligence and I put my property under contract and something comes up down the road uh, during due diligence, well, what can I do? I can walk away and get my earnest money back. I can also file a complaint with the North Carolina Real Estate Commission against that particular broker because they wasted my time, my energy and potentially my money during due diligence. Right, I can file a complaint. Uh, if I get past due diligence and I find out I can't get my earnest money back, and I find out based upon the broker's representation or misrepresentation about something uh, that something turned out not to be true, and it changes the entire deal, meaning I have to either pay less money because the deal wasn't what was represented to me, uh, I could then file a complaint with the commission. I might have grounds to sue the broker, of course, and the seller might as well because might have those grounds as well because the broker screwed something up. Uh, that was material to the deal getting closed, right? So brokers have a lot of liability on their hands and usually they carry something called errors and omissions insurance. So they make an error or an omission of fact uh, and that insurance will cover any claims against them. So um, that's how they cover those claims. Obviously, if they get sued, it could happen and all brokers know this and they carry the errors and omissions insurance, all right? Misrepresentation and being a broker does not exempt them just because a property is sold as is or something like that is does not exempt them from uh, disclosing material facts, things that they know or things that they should have known because they are a self storage broker. All right. So when a, when a broker comes to you and, and, and says, oh, well, you know what? I mean, it's sold as is. Sorry that you found out that you can't build more, but it's sold as is anyway. They think that's the get out of jail free card and it's not whatsoever, because as a broker, they should have known, they should have known to go check the planning and zoning website. They should have known to verify the NOI or to verify the unit mix. Uh, maybe NOI is a little tough, but verifying the unit mix uh, to make sure that the number of units that are represented in the offering memorandum and to me on the phone as a buyer is accurate and true uh, to the best of their, their knowledge and ability. All right. So we had this happen several times, actually, uh, and it comes down to Flood zones, for some reason, there's a deal floating around, uh, and I don't really care. I'm just going to put this out there. There's a deal floating around in Asheville right now where you can develop, uh, <clears throat> I forgot the exact characteristics of it, but it's got a big like L-shaped uh, area where it says you can develop there. Um, and technically you can, but I don't recall anywhere in the offering memorandum, maybe they changed it since then. But when I first looked at this deal in the offering memorandum, it doesn't say anything about a flood zone. But if you go on to the planning and zoning website and the GIS, uh, Geographic Information System for the county, I forgot the name of the county, but it's up in Asheville. Um, if you look on the GIS, you'll see that you can toggle off and on the flood zone. And this property where you can build and so-called expand is in a flood zone. And it's in the, uh, not, in, not in like a, it's in the 100 year floodplain is what it's in. Okay, so in order to build and develop there, you'd have to actually pad up the dirt so that the bottom, the very bottom of your building is uh, at the, what they would call the, the maximum average height of the water uh, when, uh, for that particular flood zone, right? So you don't just build it where the land is now, you have to actually pad it up and then build there. <clears throat> so should that be that it's in the flood zone, this flood zone, should that be disclosed in the offering memorandum? I think so, right? So I spent time and energy looking at the deal, then get on the website on the Planning and Zoning Commission website and lo and behold, it's in a flood zone. So we're out. We're not going to do that deal. All right. Other folks might not have checked it right away and they get down the path and make an offer and they find out later on it's in a flood zone. Hey, we're out on this deal. Or you got to come down on the price because there's no way with our construction costs and all that, that we can build here um, without having to jump through some extra hoops and cost us more money. Right. So I've had this happen at least once, twice, I think three times that a property is in a flood zone and the broker has done nothing to actually disclose that information, uh, even after bringing it up to them. Uh, they'll say, oh, thank you for letting us know that. 
uh, we'll be sure to let the next buyer know. And at that point, can I call the real estate commission and file a complaint? Sure. But does it do anything for me? Not at that point. Uh, if we're in a due diligence and I've spent money and all that, that's a different story. But we're just looking at the deal from a high level. And however you, Mr. and Mrs. Broker, want to run your deals, you know, when you present them to the people, that's up to you. But, um, you know, I'll, I'll look at everything with a grain of salt. So anyway, that happens with flood zones. Uh, it could happen with converting to climate controlled units uh, or potential development. Uh, they won't disclose that it's not zoned. If it's zoned, it'll usually be disclosed in the offering memorandum. Hey, zoned for storage. You could do it by right because they, they want that to be out there. They want people to know that. If it's not zoned, they usually won't say uh, that it's not zoned. Um, we're, we are in a deal right, right now. I can't say much about it yet, uh, but there was a major uh, material fact uh, and I could argue misrepresentation uh, on this deal. Major, 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 major. We'll talk about it later, uh, but we're able to work through it and get it worked out. But when I talk about it, probably in the next webinar, when we talk about some of these topics here, it is going to be very shocking and surprising to you how little homework the uh, broker did on the deal before bringing it to market. Uh, but absolute uh, buffoonery. Okay, so I don't know what else to, how else to call it. Uh, anyway, so these are the things you should be aware of. Okay, so what brokers hope you don't understand? Agency. Who do they represent? They represent their client. So what does that mean? It means several things, but they're a fiduciary to their client, right? And they have to disclose to their client everything about you. But they also have to disclose to you as a buyer everything that they know or should have known about the property. And if they don't, they could be uh, falling under a serious, serious violation of misrepresentation, uh, whether it's willful or negligent uh, or omission, of course, willful or negligent omission. And they can get in trouble for that stuff. Most buyers, I would say, especially folks who are starting out, maybe they're not licensed. Uh, they don't know these things, right? And a broker is hoping that you won't know because if I do something wrong, if a broker does messes up, you know, you don't really know what to do, right? They have kind of, they, the broker seems like they have all the power in the transaction, and they have some, maybe when you're starting out, because they can steer certain things in a certain direction and kind of help their buyer, or excuse me, their seller go with a particular offer from a particular uh, buyer, a particular customer. Um, and that's true to a certain extent, uh, although they're not supposed to do that. All right. They're supposed to present all offers uh, and not show any partiality toward any one offer. But in some sense, you can't control what happens behind the scenes. Okay. So don't be afraid of brokers. There's no reason to be afraid of them. Remember the real estate commission, your state real estate commission represents your best interest, not the best interest of the broker. So if you feel like a broker is not treating you fairly, uh, you can call the real estate commission and lay out the scenario for them. Please do it objectively, right? You don't need to say, Chris told me to do all this and you're mad about something and turns out that you're completely wrong because you misunderstood something, but lay out this whole situation to the real estate commission and ask them, what should the broker have done? Or am I off somewhere? Am I just not understanding the process here? Please help me out. And the commission will help you out. In the state of North Carolina, you can actually talk to an attorney um, that works for the commission and they will answer any questions that you might have uh, as a consumer, as the general public. All right. And lastly, remember, as is does not exempt a broker from disclosing material facts. So just because the property is sold as is, that means nothing. If a broker is supposed to know or should have known, they could be held liable for that uh, misrepresentation or omission of material fact. All right. Uh, again, probably before we get to the next topics of like what motivates a broker, et cetera, uh, probably what will happen is you'll get, you'll look at a deal and you'll find out something like I, like we found out about the uh, flood zone stuff, right? It's not going to be consequential to you. Uh, most likely in the very beginning, if you're doing your homework and you're doing your due diligence prior to making an offer, Right? Most things that you might find out about a flood zone or being able to develop and add more units or something like that will not be super consequential if it turns out you can't do it and you can't do the deal or it just doesn't make sense. It's not penciling out. Once you get into under contract and due diligence, that's a different level right? because now you're spending money uh, on third-party reports, uh, tying up a lender right, or deciding on a lender, et cetera. So putting down um, some... Uh, some fees regarding that or something, you know, along those lines for a survey and whatnot, like it's, you're spending money. And so if you find out something during that time period that you can't get the deal done the way you thought it could because of a material fact uh, that was not disclosed or uh, willfully omitted from the broker, now you do have something where you call the commission, you say, look, this guy or this gal is, is messing me up here. Here's the scenario. 
what can be done and they can lay it out for you. Okay. You can also talk to your attorney, which that's the first stop there is talk to your attorney about the scenario and the situation. Um, and they will likely advise you on what you can and can't do uh, in that situation. All right. Okay, so let's talk about the final last couple bullet points here. Uh, let me look in the chat. I think you guys have posted some stuff. Let me let me see here. Uh, boop, 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 boop. Chip is asking, is hiring a self-storage buyer's broker common? No, it's not really. Um, usually most storage brokers want to represent the seller because they want to get the listing. Uh, the way you control, control your business and build your business is through listings. It is not primarily working with buyers. And that's true in residential as well. Uh, the way you build your business and control your business and control your time is by working with uh, sellers, not with buyers. All right. So uh, it's very common to have a seller's agent um, in uh, storage, not common to have a buyer's agent. You could um, contact a buyer's agent, you know, one of these firms or whatever, or your local, you know, Keller Williams commercial, whatever, and say, hey, here's a list of properties. Call them for me. I am qualified, here's who I am, et cetera. I will buy any of these on this list. If you can get the seller to sell, uh, you know, you can represent the seller, right? And if you get the seller to sell to us, the seller will pay you a commission. Uh, otherwise, if you want to represent us, we'll sign an agreement, something like that. I'll pay you X amount on each of these deals. You can put up, draw up an agreement and they start making phone calls for you. The nice thing is agents work for free, right? They work for commissions. So you can work out an agreement with somebody like that um, who might want to do some work for you, knowing that you're a qualified buyer to purchase properties but it's not too common. Uh, one large group that uses a buyer's agent situation is a prime storage group. If you guys look them up, prime storage, they use the storage acquisition group as their buyer representative. So if you ever go to the conferences, you see storage acquisition group, they represent prime storage. All right. And they are buying deals for prime storage. Prime is one of the largest private um, operators, owners of uh, owner operators of self storage in the U S Prime Group Holdings, I think is the name of it. Uh, Rogelio is asking, are, seller, are selling brokers required to disclose that a competitor will be entering the area? Uh, selling brokers. So in other words, like, okay, I get it. So you're looking to buy a property somewhere, storage facility somewhere, and uh, there's like development a mile down the road or something like that. Yeah, because that's about the surrounding area. And there's enough data out there to show who's coming in and who's, who's doing what. So if you ask the broker, and you tell them, hey, are there any competitors coming? We're going to send you our offer you know, next week or whatever, or we're going to look at the package and, and go from there. Do you know of any development coming in down the road uh, or in the three-mile radius? And the guy or gal says, no, I don't know of anything. And they actually do because you go to Radius Plus or Yardy Matrix or whatever, and you log in and boom, right there is planned development. You know, And it takes you the link, takes you to the literal site plan. Uh, come on. The broker knew, and they lied to you. All right, so can you sue them or something at that point? No. Can you report them to the commission? Sure. Will anything happen? Who knows, right? Probably depends on how many complaints they've gotten at that point. Uh, but now you know this broker is not to be trusted, right? And especially if you bring it up later on, you say, hey, I asked you about that earlier on. I did see that there's some development here. Did you know about that? Uh, and you can ask them point blank, right? And see what they say. Or you just say, hey, I found this development down the road. It changes our pricing. It changes our lease up. It changes uh, kind of everything about where we think we get on rents and everything because they're going to come out of the ground here in about six months. Uh, so we can't do what we thought we could do. We got to come down on our price. Uh, the broker should have known that, right? And you can say to him, him or her, hey, man, as a broker, you should have known that. I'm sure your seller knows. So this is a reasonable price concession that we're asking for here, All right. So that's how you would handle that conversation. As a broker, they should have known. Especially as a storage broker, they should have known. Chip is asking, as a buyer, are you protected by the laws of your state if you are not making an offer if you are making an offer that's out of state, uh, it depends on where the property is located. So the agent will have their license, let's say in Colorado, and you're looking at a property in Colorado, it's going to be governed by the laws of, in, of Colorado, not by the laws of your state. So if you're located in Alabama or something like that, and you're buying in Colorado, the property is located in Colorado, the jurisdiction will be the state laws of Colorado. Um, and then one other thing too, you'll see oftentimes, um, uh, Berkshire Hathaway, Cameron Vale, and those guys, they do a really good job of this. And there's other ones I can't think of off the top of my head. But every, time, every single time I open up one of their offering memorandums, it'll say um, listed by or something like that uh, with JDS services. And like it'll have a person's name on there. To list property out of state, you have to affiliate with a broker 
uh, that's in the state where the property is located. And that's why they do that. And so they can be, uh, I think Cameron is out of Tampa, Florida, if I'm not mistaken, that's where he lives. He's licensed in Florida, but being licensed in Florida, he can sell a property in North Carolina as long as he affiliates with a broker in the state of North Carolina. So that's what that is for. If you ever see that in an offering memorandum, that's what they're doing. That, that doesn't affect your situation. I just wanted to mention it because you were asking about out of state um, purchasing. That doesn't affect any of us really. It's like a license thing, but that's why you see it in some of the offering memorandums. Uh, Yvonne, hopefully I'm pronouncing your name right, ma'am. Sorry if I'm not. Uh, Yvonne's asking, does climate controlled have to be zoned? It depends, uh, no, like the buildings themselves, no. But if you wanna add more buildings, the county isn't really going to care, or the city isn't going to care uh, if they're climate or not. They're going to look at the buildings and, and what they are, and, uh, impervious surface and groundwater and all this kind of stuff. Uh, if you want to turn them into climate controlled, they would want to know, obviously, where your power and all that's coming in from, but they aren't going to care too much. Really, is it zoned for storage is going to be the question, climate controlled or non-climate controlled. Is it zoned for self-storage development? Can I add more units to the site? We have a deal under contract right now. Um, and um, it's it, it was zoned industrial like I-1, uh, which is usually in most municipalities is you can do storage by right, meaning that they have a whole list of what you can build like in an industrial zone and mini warehouses, they call it that sometimes or self-storage something, they'll call it that. And that's usually by right. But in this case, it has a conditional use. So we actually have to go through a rezoning in order to get the storage added on. Uh, it's an existing site. We want to build more. So we have to go through rezoning, even though it's zoned industrial. The broker disclosed all that information to us. So we understood the process. So they did a good job in that case. All right. Uh, Mel is asking, what is the best way to present a creative offer to a broker, like a lease option, seller carry, et cetera? Um, it depends on the broker. They should know what some of those things are. Like when you go through the North Carolina real estate licensing course, they, we talk about some of those things. Um, so different ways to purchase property. Um, so if they're a broker, they should be familiar with all that. They shouldn't have to be educated on it. Uh, and I guess it depends on the state and what the state, how they educate their brokers. Uh, but you can do like what's done before, like where you have like your options. So seller carry, you might have bullet points and you say, okay, here's how we'll do this and structure it this way. Essentially the seller is acting like the bank, you know, so on and so forth. Um, a lease option, you know, whatever, whatever the, the situation is, you just have to explain it to the broker. Hopefully they would have a general understanding of that. Um, uh, and you can actually call the real estate commission and ask them in your state and say, Hey, when brokers get their licenses, do you guys talk about alternative ways to hold title or to own property? So there's just a traditional way of buying, right? So there's a new deed and all that kind of stuff or deed is transferred. I'm sorry, uh, to a new buyer, but what about like these other ways of doing it? Seller carry, et cetera. Um, uh, I just, the term just flipped, slipped my mind, but there's different ways, um, uh, there's one in North Carolina and it's kind of a blanket term, but it just slipped my mind. But yeah, you might want to use, so you either have bullet points explaining to the broker what you're trying to do. You can kind of uh, call the commission and say, and do a little advanced research and say, hey, do you teach your brokers these things uh, when they get their license? Because that'll give you an idea of this, should the broker already have some general knowledge of these alternative ways of, of holding title to property. All right. But in some cases, you just have to, uh, you just have to educate. It also depends on the types of deals you're doing. If they're an experienced broker who's selling smaller deals, maybe they're on um, LoopNet or uh, Argus. Argus has a lot of smaller brokers, right, that sell smaller deals. They'll have heard of those things in the past, if they're, especially if they're an experienced broker. Uh, they'll, they'll have heard of those things. It might be kind of tough to get seller carry at this point in time just because the economy is good and everyone wants to buy storage, but you, you never know, right? You might find a guy or gal who's retiring and they like that idea. So, Okay, so what motivates a broker? Let's get into these last couple of bullet points before we wrap it up, okay? What motivates a broker? Well, obviously closing the deal, getting paid, commission, right? Brokers work for free. I mentioned that earlier on, they work for free, right? So they, they don't get paid until they close the deal. So what motivates them? Closing the deal. When they get that listing and they have that commission, you know, set like whatever it is, 1%, 3%, whatever the commission rate is, and they have that list price in mind and they know, okay, the market is this and we probably should go, we, we should get at least list, if not a little bit above list, they're already doing the math on how much money they're going to make. And they've already spent the money <laughs> in their mind uh, before that listing ever gets to market. Okay. So that's what motivates a broker is getting the deal closed. Uh, what happens usually is if the market, if the deal is priced above where the market's coming in, what do they usually say to the seller? The market has spoken, right? So in other words, Mr. And Mrs. Seller, uh, we priced it at a million dollars. 
Uh, we felt good about that based upon these comps or whatever the story is. All the offers came in around seven hundred to eight hundred thousand dollars, and we got four offers from qualified buyers. Um, and apparently, the market has spoken and shown us that the the market price for your property is seven to eight hundred thousand dollars, somewhere in there. Uh, what would you like to do, Mr. And Mrs. Seller? So they're not going to take, you know, they're not going to take full responsibility for mispricing the property. They still want to get the deal closed, right? So we've had brokers reach out to us and say. Uh, hey, your offer was this, the offers came in lower and all that. Can you resubmit uh, another offer? Or, or if the buyer changes, or excuse me, if the seller changes these terms, will it work for you in that case? Because they want to get a deal done, right? They got to get a deal done. So what motivates a broker? Getting that commission check when it closes. Well, what kind of buyers do brokers want to want to uh, work with? People who can close, right? Let's just think logically. If I want my commission check, I want to work with somebody who can close the deal, and it'd be better to work with somebody who has experience and have closed in the past, right? So real easy. What motivates them? Commissions. What kind of buyers do they want to work with? People who can close. All right. So what if you never close anything? That's the, last, the second to last bullet point here. How do you convince a broker to work with you? If you've closed stuff in the past, it's easy because you closed, right? This, this business gets easier uh, the more you do it. The more time goes by, you close some deals, it gets easier. All right, uh, passive investing as, a, as on the multifamily side, we just put our largest multifamily deal under, under contract. I think it's a $100 million deal. All right, the first deal they, they started with was like less than that. All right, so much less than that. All right, so it gets easier as time goes by to convince brokers to work with you because you close deals. But in the very beginning, it's not so easy. So how can you do that? You want to, uh, you're, you're aiming for the, uh, to help the broker understand that you can close. Well, what can I do? I could put together a one pager about myself or my team. <coughs> Excuse me, if I have a team, uh, myself. If I have some real estate experience, I know how to close. You know, I've taught real estate licensing classes or whatever. I've been a broker for 10 years or something like that. I understand the process and what it takes to get the deal closed. Okay, put that down on paper about yourself. Um, if you don't have any experience, you're not a broker, you just started out, put down your business experience, put down uh, on paper, I'm talking about a bio of yourself, what you've done using numbers. Okay, if I started a business, grew revenue from X to X, X to Y, I should say. Uh, if I have this much money in the bank, I have this much capital set aside for this. Uh, I've done this education seminar and I've, I've learned about the business and I'm reaching out to brokers like yourself to get started in the business, right? Brokers aren't going to shun you for the most part uh, just because you're brand new. We had some calls with larger groups out there when uh, we had just gotten started really with our fund and we had put, I can't remember if we had one deal or just no deals under contract yet at that point. Uh, but they said to us point blank, hey, we don't want to discourage anybody from making offers, right? So if, if brokers or in presenting their offers, because brokers know that some groups start really small with nothing and then they grow and they do a lot of business with them over time. So we've heard that from a couple of different brokers. So if you're working with some professional brokers who do storage, they aren't going to uh, stack all the cards against you, okay? It, just because you're new, um, because they don't know where you're going to end up, and you might be a legitimate, solid buyer and repeat client for them in the future, right? So don't think that the cards are stacked against you totally. They're not. But what I would do is I put together a one pager. Uh, I'd get some lender references. You guys have heard me say this before. There's no such thing as a pre-qualification letter uh, in commercial real estate or in storage but you can have conversations with lenders ahead of time and say, hey, uh, you know, whatever, whoever the lender might be, hey, we've talked to these guys over at such and such bank, uh, give Ralph a call. Here's his number and his email. He can verify that I've talked to him about getting a loan to purchase self-storage. And uh, they will be more than likely, to, uh, and, and if they do that, then they'll see, oh, okay, so-and-so has done some homework. They've got their cards in line, right? They're thinking commission. They're thinking certainty of close. So what happens, what needs to happen to close? Well, you got to have a lender, property management, all that stuff. So talk to a lender, get a reference. Say, hey, uh, Ralph, I talked to you today. I took you to lunch. We had, we had some conversations around storage. Can I use you as a reference as I'm going out to talk to brokers? And he'll, he will say, hopefully, say, yeah, yeah, no problem. And what do you mean by reference? Well, just they want to know that I can close. And so having had a conversation with you, uh, will let the broker have a little bit more confidence in knowing that I've already done my homework and getting my capital in line and the debt in line to close on a deal. They'll say, yeah, sure, no problem. 
right? So that's a lender reference. If you're going to manage yourself, that's one thing. If you're going to use a property management company, have a conversation with that property management company ahead of time and then do the same with them as a lender reference. All right, get on Fiverr. Uh, and then same thing with capital partners. If you're going to raise capital or you have a couple partners you're putting together some money, uh, have all their names on there. Even though you might be the active person looking for deals, right? And putting everything together, that's fine. Have some of their names and maybe pictures on uh, on your one pager. This is, I'm trying to get to this thing here to share a screen. Um, so this is our one pager that we, somebody hit in the, in the chat. Whoops, I moved that off the thing here. Somebody in the chat, uh, let me know you can see this real quick. Can you guys see this one pager? Just give me a thumbs up or in the participant thing or just say, yep. Can you guys see this? Let me move this over here. Sorry, I'll move these off the screen. So this is our one pager. Okay, good. Thank you guys. Appreciate that. This is our one pager. It's in PDF form here. Thanks, Mel. Appreciate it. Um, if I zoom in a little bit. Okay, now this looks really nice, right? So I didn't create this. Uh, we have an in-house team that creates this stuff. But look, you can, you're on the video now. This will be on YouTube later. Just pause the video, look at the different sections, and just copy the format. I don't, nobody cares, right? Or just make it your own, change it up a little bit, right? So there's a picture of me, there's John, there's my bio here. I could probably update this a little bit, but it's all right. Here's a little bit about us. Here's where we're looking for deals. Here's the types of deals we're looking for. Uh, here's the deals we closed. Before, this did not say closed, okay? So we had under contract or something like that. I can't remember, but we closed these deals. All right. And then we have some other others as well. We can add to this, but we don't want to do that right now. Capital sources. So I wanted to mention something about this because brokers are wonder, hey, where are you guys sourcing capital from? Well, here's our debt. We're using debt, uh, storage debt brokers to source debt for us. And then we have equity that we're coming in from our fund. And here's how you contact us, et cetera. Now you don't may not have a fund. That's okay. Who cares? Just say, hey, I have this much money in the bank, or I might I have this much money fund set aside. Uh, I have these capital partners. Write a little bit about yourself, right? Uh, right. The reason you do this. And you might not even put it on a PDF. Maybe you just put a couple of bullet points in an email, all right? Because uh, all of us tend to think you hear something, but what? We believe it when we see it. I'll believe it when I see it, right? A lot of us say that, right? So if I say it to you on the phone and I'm brand new, I'm saying, I'm Chris, I'm just getting started in the business, but I have had, I've had conversations with lenders and property management companies. And here's what I'm doing. Here's my plan. I have a couple of capital partners. We're looking for deals under $500,000 in the Charlotte Metro area or in Greenville, South Carolina, or in San Antonio, right? Or in the state of Alabama, whatever. Here's our criteria. And then take all of that and put it in bullet points in an email so that they can see it. Add your picture to it so they know who you are. All right. So that's just a, an easy way to get started. And as you close more deals, then obviously add photos and all that stuff. We don't need to use this as much, uh, because we've introduced ourselves to brokers and kind of they gotten to know us, but we did use this in the very beginning um, when we were starting out, okay? But put it on paper so that they'll see. All right, I'm gonna start, stop my share real quick. Um, let me look in the chat before we wrap this thing up. I think I saw somebody had a question about something. Where'd the chat go? Oh, here it is, okay. Um, Okay, Mel saying most brokers hate offering creative deals to their sellers due to lack of understanding or fear of not getting a commission. That's exactly right. Why? Because they work for free. They want a commission, right? How do we get around the neg negativity or is there a way to entice vanilla brokers to present our creative offers? If you present an offer, a broker is required to present the offer to their seller. So it doesn't matter how you present it or whatever, they're required to present the offer to the seller. Hands down, like they have to present offers. Uh, that's in the state of North Carolina. Obviously, check with your state, but I'm sure it's the same. Uh, realtors also are under a higher ethical um, standard where they have to present all offers, okay? So it doesn't matter if they hate doing it. It doesn't matter if they don't understand it. What you can do, and I've actually done this, where you can say, look, I appreciate what you're doing. I want to present my own offer to the seller. Um, and I'd like you to set up an appointment, uh, a phone call via Zoom or in-person meeting where I can present my offer to the seller. And uh, they cannot control the seller's time. They are not a general agent. They are a special agent, right? So they cannot say, no, no, my seller's not doing that. Well, did the seller specifically tell you that they're not doing that? No. Well, then this is what we're doing. I'm going to present my offer to your seller, uh, you know, so on and so forth. So we, we got to a situation where um, we needed to ask the seller for something uh, once on a deal. And we weren't making any headway with the broker. So at uh, one point, I just stopped the conversation, said, I'm going to uh, present the offer to the seller. 
directly. Uh, I'd like you to set that up. And they agreed because they can't, they can't argue with that. They can't control the seller's time. All right. Now, some of you guys not, might not feel so bold as to do that, uh, but you can do that. You can ask them to set up a call or a meeting where you can present your own offer. Um, oftentimes, brokers don't want to do that, especially if they're working with like a, a, a counterpart, another like a buyer's agent broker, because they don't want that agent stealing their business, right? So sometimes they feel very protective of that kind of stuff, which is understandable. Uh, but you are able to control that part of the process if you want to. It might be the first time you ever heard that, all right? So, um, and yeah, right now, creative deals are just tough because how do they get paid, right? How do I get paid? If you can show the broker that, well, here's how you make a commission uh, on it, I'll chip in and I'll cover part of the commission or whatever, you know, it is. The broker's probably not going to care as long as you get the deal done, right? They want certainty to close and they want to get paid because they work for free until the deal closes, all right? Um, Let's see, uh, Yvonne's asking, if they ask for proof of funds, um, you could show them your bank account statement, just black out some stuff. Uh, or you can say, uh, well, we have a couple partners and we're gonna put some, put you know, the deal together that way. Uh, each of us have this much money and we're gonna put it into the deal, something like that. You might have three different proof of funds if you want, uh, but they're trying to figure out if you can actually close the deal. Again, certainty of close. They don't wanna waste time, right? Same thing with the seller. The seller wants certainty of close too. Um, so if they ask for proof of funds, it's because they don't feel confident in who you are as a group uh, and your potential to buy or close the deal. If you don't have any money uh, and you're looking for deals to purchase, you need to go find money first. Don't go try to find deals to buy and you don't have any money because now you're going to be stuck. If they ask for proof of funds, you don't have any money, then yeah, I don't have any advice for you <laughs> other than to say, go get some money and then go look for deals. That's the way it should be done. Go talk to a lender first. Go talk to capital partners first then go out and look at deals, right? Uh, and when I say look at deals, I mean like actually make offers on deals. Uh, if you're trying to learn the business, right? And go and kind of put together a, pre a presentation for a capital partner, then sure, look at deals, look at offering memorandums, put together some underwriting and all that. Talk to brokers, do that homework ahead of time, right? But if you're actually making offers on deals, get your money straight first before wasting anybody's time, okay? Uh, and yeah, can you buy deals, no money down, all that kind of stuff? Uh, yeah, I'm sure it's possible. Um, I'm sure it's possible. But you need to partner with somebody who has money uh, and you need to use probably some sort of creative financing. And even there, they're going to see, do you have any money to put down to put this financing in place? All right. And if you're working with a mom and true mom and pop seller who isn't worried about all those things, I would have a, a red flag would go up for me. Um, because are they actually serious about selling? If I'm going to sell my half million dollar facility or whatever I think is worth half a million bucks or a million bucks to somebody, I'm going to do creative financing. Don't I want to know if they actually have the money to do this thing? Yeah. So if they aren't asking you those questions, uh, there's probably a red flag. If they are asking you those questions, then they must be a serious seller. All right. Sorry, I'm babies outside the door here. That's my signal uh, that it's about time to wrap this bad boy up. So if, if you guys have any other questions, happy to look over those, pop them in the Q&A of the chat. Otherwise, real quick, we covered uh, what brokers hope you don't understand. Number one being agency. Uh, we talked about representing someone else's interest, right? The type of agency there is, general, universal, and special. Uh, we talked about customers versus clients, right? The agent represents the client, and they owe the client fiduciary duties. We listed those out, but one of those is disclosure. And then the agent does not owe the customer those fiduciary duties, but they do owe them honesty, fairness, and disclosure of material facts, right? So then we talked about what material facts are, uh, anything about the property, anything about the surrounding area, anything affecting the ability to perform or to close the deal, uh, and then anything about that's important to a party. Um, and we talked about defects about the property itself. So like how many units does it have? Is it in the flood zone, et cetera? Facts about the surrounding area. And somebody asked me, uh, hey, if development's coming down the road, another facility, another competitor, should they know about that and let me know? Yes, they should. So facts about the surrounding area. And then obviously uh, about the buyer, the seller themselves, are they able to close? Are they under the gun on a 1031 or something like that? Uh, misrepresentation, right? So sometimes agents don't want to disclose material facts uh, or they just don't even know. Uh, well, can they get in trouble for not knowing? Yes, because they should have known because they're an agent with a license. Uh, they should have known to do more due diligence as an agent to make sure that they're not misrepresenting something or omitting a material fact, right? We talked about willful and negligent misrepresentation and then willful and negligent omission and what that looks like. And we used the example of a flood zone and we used the example of converting or adding more units to a property or a site. 
And again, as is does not exempt a broker from disclosing material facts. Now, when you get in the real world, do brokers not disclose and not tell people stuff? Yes, it happens all the time. What can you do? Well, you can call the commission and, and report them if you'd like to. In reality, before you get make an offer and actually go into contract, is it going to hurt you very much? No, not, not really. Just kind of waste your time a little bit. Uh, but it'll help you understand what you should be looking at going forward in the future. If you do go under contract and you spent some money and you discover something that should have been known by the broker, now you might have something where you can kind of beat them over the head a little bit and get a price concession because they should have known and should have disclosed some information to you. All right, what motivates a broker? Commissions, right? What kind of buyers do they want to work with? People who can close, right? Closing and commissions. So what do you need to do to convince a broker to work with you? Get your money straight first before actually making offers. If you're doing some research ahead of time, no problem whatsoever. Don't make offers yet until you got some money in line. Uh, put together your one pager, talk to a lender, talk to your capital sources, get those things together so that when you go talk to a broker and say, hey, I'm a legitimate buyer, that they can actually see, oh yeah, I can call these references uh, and this lender or this couple of lenders and they talk to them. I can call the property management company that this buyer has talked to the property management company. And we'll likely use them to close the deal. Okay, I feel a bit more comfortable uh, getting down, going down the path with this potential buyer, even though it's their first deal. And remember, brokers are not trying to stack the cards against you, right? They, they don't know if you're going to be a good buyer in the future. So of course, they have to submit all offers. So they will submit your offer to the seller and you just never know how things work out. So they're not, they're not going to try and, and, and kind of box you out of every deal. That, that should not be the case. Um, they should be working with you and presenting your offers to the seller. All right. If you have any questions about real estate license law in your state, remember to check with your local real estate commission. All right. And they can answer any questions that you have uh, about those things and how it works, how agency and all that works in your state. Okay. I think that's it, guys. We went about an hour. Hope you guys are doing okay and stuck in there. Thank you for sticking with me during the entire uh, presentation on how to work with brokers in self-storage. Uh, if you have any questions and you want to follow up, hit us up on the Facebook group page. All right. Till next time, catch you soon.